If you're here for the Lambda Calculus and Haskell talk, this is the right place. If you're not, go find something more interesting. It's not hard at this conference. My name is Adam McCullough. I am a software engineer at IMVU. That was the logo on the previous slide and this thing right here. I'm the wizard tower pretty much everywhere, yeah. including, hi, yeah, including Slack and Twitter and makes it easy for y'all to stack and stalk and harass me. <laughs> you do it for fun, come on. So, So this is meant to be for beginners. I'm not expecting you to have like a PhD in CS. I'm not expecting you to know a ton about Haskell. Um, no experience is assumed. The point, yes? May we ask questions about the language of Haskell? Yeah, go for it. Is even novice, real novice questions? A ask away. So that was going to be my follow-up point, actually, is if I confuse you with anything here, jump up and down and stop me. I would much rather not get through this slide deck and explain what's going on than get through it and have you all be confused. Cool. The other point I'm trying to advance here is my own little subversive philosophy here because my general approach is I don't just want to know why things work, I want to know how, like not just how but why. If any of you are Star Trek nerds, you've seen that wonderful little clip from Wrath of Khan about that. That's because you don't know why things work the way they do on a starship. And that always really spoke to me. And that's something that I've always tried to pursue in my own career. And when I get to that moment, I always in both enjoy my work and do better at my work. So hopefully I can inspire you to start doing that if you're not already. Of course, if you're going to Lambda Conf, that's probably preaching to the choir. Anyway. Like I said, mo so most technical guides suck. Like, oh, here, let me just show you this really, really quick, easy way to do things. And oh, by the way, lenses. I'm done. Bye. See ya. Like, that doesn't help anyone. That's No matter how well-intentioned that is, you're not doing anything but showing off how smart you are. And that's... I'm not disparaging people when I say that. Teaching is hard. We've had several keynote people, keynote speakers, make that point. So I'm trying to do my best to get better at this and help you do the same, which is also like if I confuse any of you, please let me know. So let's start with the simplest thing in Lambda Calculus, which is the identity function. That's how you write it. Four characters. Can't be too intimidating. Let's walk through what each part of this means. So we have lambda. Lambda calculus, lambda conf. This is kind of a big deal. This just means begin what's called a lambda abstraction. In most cases, this just gets called a function. The second part says, I'm taking one argument and binding the value of that argument to the name x. The next part separates the function header from the function body. That's that. This will come up later. This is the function body. What we do to the argument, the values we've taken in now that we have them. In this case, we don't do anything to them. So let's put all this together. This is a function, lambda abstraction, that takes an argument, binds the value of that to x, and immediately returns it. So you give me something, I give it right back. That's it. We're done. We can go home now. Pleasantly enough, we want to write this in Haskell. It's nearly identical. The what? The lambda notation. How is it So this is Haskell, right? Yes, this is Haskell. And the original notation with notation. That the the this so. This is lambda calculus. This is the stuff that was discovered to be equivalent to the Turing machine back in like the. I don't know if I would call it mathematical notation, but this is what you would read on a textbook or Wikipedia. No, go for it, please. Interrupt me. For those of you who didn't show up, if I confuse you at any point, stop me. I am much happier not getting through this deck than leaving you confused. My job is to make this simple for you. 
That is my job and my goal, like my personal mission. So stop me. All right, where was I? So this is how you write the same thing in Haskell. I'm pretty sure this is actually the implementation of it, or at least somewhat close. Let's break down what this means. So we use slash here instead of lambda because Greek characters on most keyboards is kind of tricky to find. We don't want to have to go to this like copypaste.com and shove it into our terminals and hope that it all just works. We still name the argument that we're taking in. We use arrow instead of dot, stylistic reasons. There's no real difference. They mean the same thing. I just take in, took in a value. Here you go. Have it back. Let's talk about algebra. I heard one person, at least one person here at this conference say that lambda calculus was just an extension on algebra. And I really like that metaphor because at the bottom of it, lambda calculus is about rewriting expressions. If some of you are coming back, coming to functional programming from C or Java or some of the more mainstream or traditional languages, the metaphor you have in your head is much closer to like punching buttons on a calculator. I put the numbers here, I pull the lever, something comes out. So when you come across some of the more interesting parts in Haskell, your, your you know, smoke comes out of your ears. That's because there's a different model going on that like the fundamental mechanics have changed on you and if you don't notice that, you're gonna have a bad time. This is why. So let's look at how we would write this in a normal like high school or college algebra class. It's not that hard, right? I have a function, I take an argument, I pull it right back. If you were to graph this, it would just be a straight line. One, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, on and on. So, oh crap, there's a test. So you have lambda x dot x and lambda y dot y. What do they do and are they different? They're not different. We just covered this. Turns out, no. The particular characters you bind the arguments to are arbitrary. If I was doing really, really snarky, I would have used like emoji or something. But, you know, aside from really hot, ha you know, ir yes. So, and they're I'm covering untyped lambda calculus, yes. There is a tight one in that divergence. That solves a few things. Um, things like the halting problem become much easier to solve in a typed lambda calculus, but we're not going to cover types until a little bit later. But in, algebra, in algebra, right, there's a lot of implicit typing. Like you can't take the derivative of a function that doesn't have some properties, or if you try to do some operations with like complex numbers, it gets a little hairy. So there's, there's some implicit types in normal algebra that when the calculus, the untyped version sort of casts aside. Are there any assumptions about the value now? In uh, lambda calculus or? No. None. <coughs> lambda calculus doesn't even have numbers. We, we build that up, we build up an abstraction that acts like them. So, good question, I'll come to that later. <sighs> All right, that's cool. Who cares, bro? And how does it work? Let's run through an example. So we have a function that takes an argument and returns it. We're sending an argument to it. I just told you lambda calculus doesn't have numbers, so that kind of kills this argument. But this is special like whiteboard paper, you know, example lambda calculus, so shush. Now the parens, this is starting to look a little like Lisp. That's just here to disambiguate the function from the value it's taking in, right? If this starts to feel a little bit like Lisp, you're on the right track. <sighs> this is a valid and correct lambda calculus expression, but we can simplify it. And the means to simplify it is called beta reduction. And like much of algebra, it's mechanical. Not all of algebra, like if you're trying to figure out how to factor a really complex equation, that requires a little bit of ingenuity but, ingenuity, but if you're just doing FOIL, like, yeah, whatever, turn the crank, you get an answer, I'm done. This is the same thing. First, we bind the argument to the name of that, that lambda specifies. 
We stripped off the function head and the separator. Rinse, lather, repeat until we're done, until we can't simplify any further. So, all right. Now, I'm abusing the, the syntax here a little. This is not how you're going to see it written on Wikipedia or a textbook, but where they all just say, oh, well, it just gets simplified immediately. I'm trying to make this extra explicit so that you don't have to spend an hour reverse engineering it and trying to figure out what's going on where, OK? So we had a function that takes an argument and binds it to the name. I just substitute it in. We still have a step left, right? We need to strip off the function head and separator. This is the head. That's the body. Little dots the separator. That's it. We're done. What happens if we pass the identity function to itself? This is where we start to realize what when the calculus doesn't care about, right? Because if we try to do this, if we try to pass f of x to f of, or g of x, you can write it, but it's, it gets a little cumbersome. But one thing that I've been trying to hammer into you is that this is a mechanical process. Don't think about it. Just do it. So all right, let's write this up. That looks pretty correct. The parens are to disambiguate. This is where it stops. This is where it starts, yada, yada. And again, I'm abusing the syntax here. This is not how you're going to see it written on, well, anywhere but here. I'm just trying to make it extra explicit for you. And we all ha obviously have some room to simplify here. And we get back what we passed in. Does that make sense to everyone? Everyone? Really? Cool. All right. So, all right. We have a function that takes one argument, but like presumably all of us have seen functions that took two or three or, God forbid, ten or more because I just need to add this one parameter. It's fine. <sighs> it's tempting to do the obvious thing, right? To do the same thing you would do in C. Oh, I just add another one to the first one, like this. Lambda x, y, dot x, y, something. Throw them together. It's not actually correct. One of the rules of how lambda calculus works is that every function takes one argument, period. The trick to this is that functions can return functions. The same thing happens in Haskell on both counts. So if I have a function that takes two arguments, just looking at it naively from the outside, that is a function that takes one argument that returns a lambda, or a function, that takes one argument and then finally gives me the result. So if you wanted to be fully pedantic, if you wanted to fully curry it out, this is how you would write it. Lambda x dot lambda y dot do something with them interesting. Good? Yeah, yeah, parse away. Curry, so you have, currying is the process of taking a function that on the surface of it takes multiple arguments and breaking it up like this. So if I have a function that takes ABC, it's being pedantic about it and saying, well, actually, that's a function that takes an A, that returns a function that takes a B, that returns a function that takes a C, and then does something interesting with them. One or more of those arguments. Question. Yeah. Right. That's the return, right? Yes. So what happens is you have the function that takes an x. So whatever value gets applied first, that gets put it placed here. Yeah. And then you have another function that takes a y. Right. And wait, wait, but, but is, that, is that bound, that it's not bound in anywhere? Uh, is, it, um, is it, or did I miss a step somewhere? No, 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 it is bound. This y, these two y's are the same, right? Yeah, right, right, right. But that's the return, right? The, the, uh, that which is in the parentheses. 
when, yeah. when you pass when you pass in an x, y has not yet been bound. When you pass in x. Right. Y, yes. Y has y has not yet been bound. Yeah, you're only giving it. One. Oh, because it'll return a function. Yes. Right, right, right. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. So, okay. All right. Now I'm, I, I was just trying to figure out exactly. What White bulb moment. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, everyone else good? Wait, let me look at it just a little longer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys don't mind, right? or I could look at it later. I mean, I don't have anywhere to be. Come on. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, along the lines of why instead of how. So why is it important to have a constraint that a function is not fixed? Why is that a It makes things simpler. Yep. It gives you a way to. One, it enables partial function application, just out of the box. Two, it gives you a uniform interface to, for everything. Yeah, I kind of get like, how it helps in the actual functional programming. Why in the original Lambda calculus would that have been? The, so the, the general like race on, like not race on that thread, but like MO and philosophy of functional programming is, is build, a, build something that is the smallest thing that will work, the absolute smallest thing. And then from that, like build the Tower of Babel. Right. So if you can divide it, divide it. Exactly. Question. Yeah. Um, so now on the, uh, on the return here. Yeah. Um, we have a space between the x and y. I, I'm sure you already said it, but what, what, was this, what does the space look like? So there is a. Return, right? No. Oh, oh, wait, oh, oh, wait. Okay, okay, I get it. I get it. So it's, it's returning x, but it's, but it's, it's a function that takes. So this is, this is the difference between x, y, and if this happens to be a function, then this is an argument, and this gets applied together as well. I'll get to you in a minute. But that also means that this isn't x, y. A third new variable that we haven't even ta talked about, right? Right, right, right. No, yeah, I, 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 there's only two variables. But now wait, so we've got, so, but the, we've got the, so inside the parentheses, we've got the lambda uh, on the left, right, is the first symbol. And then we have uh, a y symbol dot x, right? So we're we saying that whole thing is a function with, this, with an extra argument of y. Is that what we're expressing? Yeah, the, the output of that function is x, y. We don't say, oh. we leave a space between x and y because we don't know what we're actually doing with the x, y because we don't know what they are. We can't say x plus y because we don't know that they're numbers. We can't say x append y because we don't right, know that they're the list. Mm -hmm. we, just, we just know that we're going to return something oh, with sorry, x and y. But, but okay, but we, okay, wait, wait. So, okay, I, I see it. But, but, why, but we, why didn't we do dot lambda x space y? Uh, they're binding holes for the whole body. Yes. Oh, wait, wait, it's, uh, what? You, you don't mind me being candid like this, do you? you Pedantry at a functional conference? Would it help to see it applied to like a third function, like go to XYZ? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand how the syntax functions. So maybe if I give you an example on the next slide? Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. If I still confuse you, stop me. Yeah, yeah. I don't <laughs> I mean, that's my job, right? Well, Did you? We can share it. We can share it. We can okay, share it. cool. Deal. Uh, Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a quick question, um, uh, kind of related to the question about um, decomposing into uh, single units. Yeah. That relates pretty strongly to doing mathematical, formal mathematical proofs, right? As we reduce our right. set, we need to be able to get to the bottom step to show that it's a valid method. The base case, and then you do your induction upwards. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. All right, let's step through this. So I've already made the Lisp analogy. I try to format this a little bit like Lisp because trying to do this otherwise is really, really ugly. So we have, this, this is the same thing as before. I know it looks different, so let me just walk you through it again. We have lambda x dot lambda y dot x y, and it's being applied to two arguments, the another identity function, and the number two, which doesn't exist in lambda calculus, but shush. <laughs> Well, all right, this goes here, first argument, first argument in the function, substitute it in, 
we still need to strip off the function header, the outer one. And then also a paren disappeared because it went away. Then this happens, right? That 2 gets applied to the lambda y. Mechanical. Substitute it in. Strip off the function head. We still have work to do. Isn't this interesting? We applied out the original function, and we can still simplify it. Well, all right. It's mechanical. Keep doing it. That gets applied. Substitute it in. Strip off the function. Oh, look, we're done. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Oh, Warm fuzzy? Yeah, that's good. OK. I already answered this. I think one of you had a question for it. But currying is taking a function that takes multiple arguments and converting it into the stepwise process that we just walked through. This can even be done with normal mathematical functions. If you look up the Wikipedia article for currying, you see this. If you have bad eyesight, don't worry about it. So we have an f, f of x, y, which just does y over x. I want to evaluate it, so I apply the first argument. So now I have a g of y, which is equal to f of 2 comma y, which is equal to y over 2. Apply that and apply another value to it. So g of 3, which is equal to f of 2 comma 3, which is equal to what? 3 over 2? Yeah. Cool. Now, sort of, kind of. If I'm doing this in algebra, what's stopping me from doing f of x 3? I have full choice over which argument I do first. I don't in lambda calculus. The other thing is that this contrivance here of saying, oh, look, I have a new function. That's, that's, that's a ritual I'm putting onto the process. That's not inherent in the mechanism. It is in lambda calculus. Yes? So the evaluation, when you're doing actual uh, evaluation lambda calculus, I assume it's not commutative in that case. You can't like, reverse. <sighs> Haskell has a function called flip, which does that. And you can build that in lambda calculus pretty easily. Exactly. Commuting is you flip your two arguments, but you only have one. Right. So there's no such thing as commutation. Which also probably goes to your question of why, does, why do we bother doing this? And what's the value we get from like, having partial functions versus multivariate functions? Why, why are we doing currying? I don't get that. Yet. Why are we doing currying? Um, well, one, it makes it so that our evaluation rules are not um, ambiguous. We just do this one thing that we're capable of doing, which is super, super helpful, especially if we start doing like useful programs in this. Like if we, so if we start implementing numbers in lambda calculus, which is just I have some value and I count how many times a function has been applied to it, and I want to add two of these numbers, that, that, that turns into a lot of paperwork very, very quickly. And we want to make sure that we have some very simple, concrete rules so that we can reason through this correctly. And also, things like higher order functions, which is what we just saw in the previous example, and partial function application let us do some really, really nice things. Um, as like home, homework for all of you, there's a talk that John Romero gave. John, no, John Carmack, excuse me, of id fame. Doom, quake, you know, kind of a big deal. And he talked about walking through the process of on a lark, on like a two-week vacation, re-implementing Wolfenstein 3D in Haskell. Because he's John Carmack and he can do that. So he did it. And one of the things that he discovered was that having partial function application as a affordance in the language meant message passing was a lot easier. Like, this character just shot here. Does he hit anything? Yes, OK. What damage does he do? This much. All of that is that application being solely applied by different parts of the engine. And that made that part a lot easier. Yes? Also, it might be useful to think about the fact that partial, partial function application kind of allows us to mimic things that we already do in algebra, but we hide it behind order of operations. Yes. 
Yes. That's a very good point. And it's, it's also a very good way to conceptualize this. I only have one, a function that takes one argument. That enforces the order of operations, which I said isn't present here. Right? This is, this is me adding rules to algebra, which is kind of what lambda calculus really is. But the other, the other gotcha to this is that if I'm trying to solve this f of x, y, say it's something like horrendously more complicated. I have, well, I don't have to, but I should use my judgment to find the best way to evaluate this and solve it. The point of computation is that they want it to be mechanical. They want it to be something that even a stupid computer can do. There's a lot of value in that, and that means taking away some of the capabilities you have as a mathematician in a class or doing this for fun. We all good? All right. Wonderful. So all right, the previous example was a higher order function, a function that took a function and a value and applied them together for you. What if we only supplied one function? This is the partial function application I just spoiled for y'all, whatever. So this is the same exact example as before, except we're missing the two. Go through the same mechanical process. The x gets the identity function, sub that in, strip off the header. Is there anything else we can do? Is there any further way to simplify this? Yeah, you can apply the y to the identity function that's in the body. It's actually a good point. I don't know if that's legal, but I like that. <laughs> Does anybody know? I, I don't think that's legal. I, I, I would be inclined to say no. Um, I, I, can't, I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure that would break. If you're looking at it as a linear ordering problem, you would have a different linear order. I could see that, yeah. I could uh, that that would be my intuition as well. I'd be a little nervous doing it. So, or, or, well, right now we this is a function, uh, and oh, not so just so a function, so but a simple one. Is, oh, so the y there is an input to z dot z. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so it's not an input to ah, okay. Um, so, the outer lambda here, lambda y dot, and this y here, that's going to be like whatever function, whatever value we apply here is going to get fed into this. And then whatever is here is going to get fed into this. So then we could, then couldn't we apply the y to the z? I think in this case we wouldn't sure lose anything. Definitely can. I think the danger is whether you can generally do that. Exactly. Like if you didn't have the identity function inside there, if you didn't have lambda z dot z, if it was something else, then can you still do it? Right. That we're not sure about. If, if lambda z, wait, 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 what's your distinction again? The, the, the internal function yeah. is, is, a, is, is an identity function. That's why, yeah. if for any reason we Are you change that, that's why yeah, that's the, the identity function is not going to change anything. Right, exactly. The danger yeah. is if you have a function that actually gives a different output, can you still do it? And it may be, but, but uh, we'd have to prove that. Right. That's why I'm a little... Because you want to. Right. <laughs> You got to prove that you can. Exactly. And that's why I'd be a little nervous. We can get away with it here. I don't know if we can get away with it generally. If somebody here knows or finds out, please let me know. Because that's a great question I didn't think of. I have another question. Shoot. So in this case, is the first argument the lambda y, the lambda z, the z, is that considered bound? Yes. Bound yes, because this was x. But y, y is not bound because there's no variable. Right. This was a function that took two arguments. We supplied it one. The second one is still hanging. How are you doing? OK. Let's look at Haskell, because you know you don't see enough of that here. Haskell has a const function. I want to show you how it works, but const is already taken, so I'll just name it my const. And this should look pretty familiar, right? This is a function that takes one argument, 
that returns a function that takes one argument, immediately drops it on the floor and kicks it across the floor and gives you the first one. And as it turns out, this is like one letter different from the function we just took. So lambda x dot lambda y dot, that's all the same. But instead of x, y, it's just x. You give me two things. I drop the second one. I give you the first one back. All right. We haven't talked about Haskell enough yet. Let's talk about types. So there are a couple of useful GHCI commands. GHCI is the Glasgow Haskell Compiler Interpreter. It's the REPL for Haskell. This is super helpful. This is like the only reason I'm even remotely coherent in Haskell. What we can do is at the prompt, we can ask colon t space value. That is asking the interpreter, what is the type of this value? For those of you who are coming here from a Lisp, a type is a description about the value. Like you can, there, there's a lot more to it, but that's a very, very, very basic description of it. This is an integer. This is a string. And you know more or less, depending on how general or specific that type is, about the value. What am I doing on time? OK. So all right, let's look at the type of the original const function. So lambda calculus, all functions are anonymous. They're not bound to a name. Haskell is not so much a Turing tar pit, unlike lambda calculus. So it lets you do these crazy wild things like name things. What? So let's read through this. Const is the name of the value. In this case, this value happens to be a function. Just happens to be. Don't worry about it. Colon colon is read as has type. So con the value const has type. A is the type identifier of the first argument. That's all we're saying about it. And as if you go on to learn more about Haskell's polymorphism, this is a really, really big statement. This is saying, I don't care what A is. In line of calculus, we don't care, but that means that we could do something wrong. We could potentially like, try to add up a Boolean. And that would work, but that would be nonsense. Haskell is trying to say, no, I'm, whatever I'm doing, it will always work for the right, and do the right thing. Arrow, dot, I'm taking in a value. I'm taking in another value. I'm giving you the first one. B is another type identifier, but it's different from A. They don't have to be different, but they are allowed to be. Now, if I take in two arguments and give you the first one, what's the type of my result? It's going to be the same type as the thing you gave me the first time. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information here. but. Takes a little while to learn how to read it. Well, all right. If I can ask the type of a value, can I ask anything interesting about a type? Can I lift this one step up? This is Haskell. What do you think? I can ask the kind of a type. What's a kind? Let me give you a few examples and see if I can develop an intuition with you all. I want to know the kind of integer. Single star. All right. Let's look at another type. Haskell syntax with the original pair, like um, paren, comma, paren, kind of goes to pieces if you try to partially apply it. So here's a new type. It happens to be a pair. A pair is something that takes two things and makes an anonymous product type of it. So it just puts them together, gives you an easy way to ship two things in one value. And again, these are universally quantified. They can be anything. I don't care. Let's ask the kind of this. Hey, Prelude, what's the kind of pair? Well, it's kind star to star to star. Hmm. Pair takes two arguments. And this looks a lot like the, the type signature for const. I take two things, and then I'm done with something. Well, all right. 
What if we apply one of those types? Say so you're not just a pair. You're a pair of integer and then whatever else. Well, all right, that goes from star to star. We've lost one. Does this remind you of anything? Am I being enough of a Socratic method to get you here? Or am I, do I need to do more? Right. Maybe partial function application? Just at the type level? Let me give you a spoiler here. This is, so the first pair is a type constructor. It has a value constructor that takes in two types. This is describing a type level function. And what can we do with all functions in lambda calculus and in Haskell as well? We can partially apply them. Kind is the way you investigate that. Scala has the same thing, they just don't have colon K, which as a Haskell developer kind of terrifies me. But, you know, hey, y'all do good work. I just couldn't. <laughs> All right, so we know what pair integer is like. What if we apply the third one? Well, not the third one, the second one. I can't count. This is why I use computers. Well, all right, pair now has the same kind as integer. I don't take anything else, I'm done. I, I know exactly what I am in life now, same as integer does. Well, at least on the type level. Integer can still be a lot of things. But as far as the type system is concerned, this thing is finished. We know exactly what this is. The function has been fully applied. It's the same mechanism, just in a few different really interesting places. Yeah. Um, so I, I entered it into uh, Prelude here. Yeah. And uh, and evaluates it, but it does, it's, it's not doing anything, which doesn't surprise me. But what uh, what does the colon k mean? Is that, a, is that something we're assigning to? Or? No. This is this is asking a question to the interpreter, the same as colon t. You remember how colon t was? Tell me the type of this value. So oh, that's what colon t means. Yes. Oh, oh so. Oh, did I skip that slide on you? I'm sorry. Okay, so there is a, let me go back. Colon T, you give it a value. What is oh, the type the of this value? Oh, and K is the kind. Yes. Okay, all right. You're asking similar information, just lifted one step up. Oh, and so I put like the number three in on T, and it'll say num A turns out. Right, yeah, that, it, numbers are weird in Haskell. Put in your, put in a string. Oh, and then I can do 5.5, .5 and it's fractional. And I put in letters, and I get uh, a, a char. Yep, list of char or string. Oh, what, uh, is, the, uh, is the colon colon denoting list? Colon colon is read as has type. Has, oh, okay. Value, has type, type. Oh, so, um, oh, it says, oh, oh and it's, it's in the square bracket notation of char, and that's a list. Right. Okay. So in that, like, exercise, colon k space list, empty list. Yes. Open, close bracket. Done. Oh, so then it's star, a uh, return star. Oh, it's uh, asterisk to asterisk? Yes. Star to star. Yeah. OK. So list. List is a type that holds a thing. It always holds the same thing. You can't have like list of one, Adam, McCullough, awesome, whatever. They all have to be the same type. What is the type of an empty list? Mm -hmm. Could be anything. You, we don't know. We haven't put anything into it. So it's a star to star. Now, if I t ask you colon k, open bracket, int, close bracket, well, I know this is a list of integers, so it's just star. Same principle, right? Wait, say that again, please. Okay, so where am I? Oh, God. Okay. Pair A, B. We don't know what A and B are as types. They can be anything. That's why it's a type of a function. List is the same way. It's written in a very generic way. It can hold anything. There are absolutely no constraints on the value, and we also can't put them on because Haskell. But <sighs> no, I, I just I just did an evaluation on, on type of A, and it says not in scope A. Well, yes, it's a type and variable I, that's local to that definition. That's not going to be in your REPL. Oh no, yeah, I, knew, I, I, but I, I I'm just curious what it signifies. But that's what we'll keep going. A means it's. A is another arbitrary name. It's alpha equivalent, right? Same kind so of alpha. Can we use any symbol in the place of A? 
any lowercase symbol. That's one of the restrictions in the Haskell syntax. Uh, okay, so and when we do something like pair with that, it's any, okay. The fact that pair is capitalized here means this is a type name. Uh, and so that's, that's not even just a convention, it's enforced. That's enforced by the compiler. That is required in the syntax. Okay. So this also means list of pair and string. So I could do bracket pair int string, each word capitalized. And that would all be kind star because everything about that whole structure has been defined. I see, okay. Huh. How about all you all? You feeling good? I have a question. Shoot. So this isn't, so in, this is very much a Haskell syntax. This isn't about type. This isn't about There's no way to, because I was like trying to figure out what that syntax is saying. Data carry. Equals carry. Right. So this is saying date, okay. You told me to fix this. <laughs> so data means I am creating a new type. Pair is the name of the type. I take in two type arguments. I have a, type const a value constructor that inhabits this type that takes two type arguments. Wait, wait, so the equals is, is a, you said a value constructor? No, the equals is not a value constructor. That's just taking the value constructor. Is it a constructor and operator or is it a conditional, is it a comparison operator? Neither. It's oh. syntax. Signifying what? Signifying that, do I have a laser on this? That this inhabits this type. But pair hasn't been defined yet? Just uh, like a conditional for that section? I mean, no, pair is defined. It's defined, it's defined right here. The outer pair. So those can be different names. Commands? Yes. They yeah, can be different so names. They can be saying they're in different namespaces. Right. It's not a language by default. Right. Okay. Inside, like a class but yes. So pair AB on the right side is the instance, or? Pair AB on the right side is the value constructor that inhabits the type. The value constructor that inhabits. Right. So that is the, so it constructs a value, given two value inputs, that happens to be of type pair. Pair. Yeah. Right? Right. And, uh, but we're, are we, but we're not yet defining what the, we're not d defining the implementation yet, are we? This is the implementation. This, this is, is all we need. That's all we need? That's all we need. To define a pair? Yeah. Huh. Okay. So okay. one of the nice, one of the, ah. one of the really wonderful things about Haskell is that doing this gives you literals for free. So if you wanted to like build a, a tree in C, you'd have to build all of this scaffolding around it to say, by the way, if you read it in this, you have to yeah. build it up in this way. Haskell, you get that for free. Huh. So you have tree left, right, right? Yeah. So you can just say as a value, tree, paren, tree, one, two, close paren, tree, three, four, close paren. And then an, a node in the middle. And so you have a tree with five, one, two, three, four. You're done. You've got a literal. Wow. Yeah, wow. right? Wow. <laughs> wow. wow. I, I might start teaching my CS stuff in Haskell. This is so cool. Dude, do it. <laughs> All right, how am I in time? Oh, crap. So that's all I have on the Haskell stuff. I want to do you, like, give you another extra little piece of fun because I had you here for some time. Haskell doesn't have a lot of stuff. As I said before, it's a Turing tar pit. You don't have if. You don't have loops. You don't have recursion. You don't have Booleans. You certainly don't have strings. You don't even have numbers. I mean you don't have them as a built-in with the language. You can do them, it's a Turing, language, Turing complete language after all, but you have to build them by hand yourself every time you use them. Did I mention it's a Turing tar pit? In case I didn't, it's a Turing tar pit. What's a Turing tar pit? A Turing tar pit is something that technically lets you do all the things that you can do in another language. It's just kind of agonizing and terrible and really, really difficult. Um, for those of you that have used Linux, awk is a Turing complete language. Someone's built Minesweeper using awk. That's the correct response. They're like, yeah! People have way more time on their hands than I do. Man, someone's done a Lisp interpreter in awk. Make a Lisp. Look it up. It was, they, that person spoke last year. I attended that talk. It was really fascinating and kind of horrifying. 
there's a, there's a repository on GitHub that has like 50 different implementations in this Lisp framework. Anything from CoffeeScript to Haskell to like awk. It's Turing complete. You can. Why? I mean, yeah, but I like myself. But anyway, Lambda Calculus is kind of in that same category, which is why we don't write in Lambda Calculus. It's why we write in Clojure or Haskell or anything but this. But let me show you how recursion works here. You also have, like, if you're more curious about this Google church encoding, and that's how you do, like, numbers and Booleans and operations and stuff. It's a lot of really interesting stuff. So the identity function is often called the I combinator. Combinator means that all the values in that function are bound. You don't have any free variables that are coming from some other magical place. The omega combinator is this. Well, this is another mechanical process. Let's do it. So the second function gets bound to x. We sub that in. We get that. Because you see how there are two copies of it, right? I'm a pedant. I like to be clear. Let's do an alpha conversion because letters are arbitrary. Man, that looks familiar. <laughs> Doesn't that just look really familiar? What happens if we do this again? I mean, I can reply the same slides again, but look. Keeps going and going and going. Yeah, like. This is how you spell an infinite loop in Lambda Calculus. This isn't what we want, but it's kind of close. This, this, if Lambda Calculus had like proper I.O., this is how you would do something like an Apache server, right? Open up this port, listen forever. Don't talk to me. But this isn't going to help you like compute a Fibonacci number or a factorial, because you're, you're just going to keep going until you stack over for your machine, right? Or until you like run out of bits in the machine to hold this horrifyingly huge number. This doesn't help. This is not good for general programming. What we need is the Y combinator. Aha! Now, some of you who maybe are in the Bay Area or hear about a lot of startups that suck up all of our money. Yes, this is where Paul Graham got the name. Paul Graham thought this was such a powerful idea, he used it for his startup incubator. What is it? Oh, it's just that. Perfectly readable, right? Come on, I don't even need to cover this. This is obvious. <sighs> Let me break this up. That looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? Looks almost like the Omega Combinator we started with, just a little different. Let me walk you through uh, like one toy example of this. One, Lambda Calculus now has named functions, because I say so. This happens to be the function that computes factorial. Now, that function takes arguments. I'm not doing that yet. So that gets bound to f, and that gets placed here. Sub it in, strip the header off, we're done. All right, cool. Well, this can get simplified, right? We still have work we can do. That's cool. Let's do that. Blarg! <laughs> All right. This is still a mechanical process. We subbed it in, strip off the header. We now have another call to this. And we can keep doing this until Factorial says, oh, I'm done. I don't need anything more. So instead of having to do the regex thing, OK, so back up. Can you balance parens in regular expressions? The answer is no, because Regular expressions doesn't have the concept of like a, a true loop. You can only count up so many regular expressions, and you have to build up that capacity by hand in the language. As soon as you get one more than that capacity is, you're done. It's kind of, that's it. That's it. You're toast. Lambda calculus doesn't have this problem. And that's one of the reasons why it's Turing complete. This is the other like aha moment that lets us build languages like Haskell and Clojure and Lisp or Scheme, or Scala, or whatever. Take your pick. That's it.